Hey guys, this is Allison from Alley Cat Creations. Please share and subscribe to my channel if you have yet to do so. And if you get anything from my work, I'll connect the dot in Epiphany, a mind explosion, a new book to read, a new author to explore. Please consider supporting my work. All the links are at the bottom of the description that helps me keep this going because there's costs in it. It's getting really tight around here in a bad way, but I'm going to project that as being good, kick my butt. And if you would like an energy exchange, more than just knowledge, I make cool decorative pieces for your home, energy, frequency, protection, pyramids, artwork, all kinds of fun stuff really affordable too and within the united states shipping is free because that's what i do so if you're interested alley cat creations 211.com i just put posts out on my social well, two social medias that i have i have some really good stuff i've been painting and um it's not done yet but soon to come to the website so keep on that and check out what i already have and email me if you're interested in anything I'm really sad. We're almost done. I really enjoyed this book, even though I don't collectively align with a lot of it. It's still good stuff. It it brings perception. That's why I like reading books because it, it sometimes changes your perception on how you see things, right? We all have different viewpoints and I think it's very important that even if we are not in an alignment with something, that we could still take something from it and maybe look at it in a different light. So I have my trusty coffee here. Um, I'm just going to put this out before I go any further. I had a severe allergic reaction and I don't know what. I have an allergy to myself. <laughs> yeah, I do. Um, I can't do anything really about it besides Benadryl and figuring out what else is triggering the response besides my own reproductive system. It's a hormone I'm allergic to. But I had um, my throat almost closed yesterday. I took Benadryl. I don't have health insurance, so I don't have an EpiPen. And it was an EpiPen status yesterday. I just really didn't feel good, and I slept it off. Um, I'm I'm better today, um, but I have a lot of pain in my back. So if I keep moving, it's like where my angel wings belong. Um, just be mindful that my mouth is still recovering. Like my tongue is a little inflamed and I got bugs around. Fun times. <laughs> so please just keep that in mind as I'm reading because I never read his work, Blavonsky's work and Awaspi. It's like, I don't know why I can't project properly, but just be mindful today. I'm still kind of recovering, but I want to get this out because we're almost done. And I, I'm looking at different books to see what I'm going to read next. I don't know, like a lot of books that I can read is fair use, meaning that I'm able to read it without repercussions. Um, everything is about money in this reality. And some publishers, not even the authors, either need permission and they never answer your email or they want money and they don't have any of that. So mind you, I try to contribute to having people purchase the books. I don't get anything for that. The mysteries and their emissaries. Did the divine knowledge which construct the supreme possession of the pagan priest crafts survive the destruction of their temples? Is it yet accessible to mankind or does it lie buried beneath the rubbish of ages entombed within the very sanctuaries that were once illuminated by its splendor? In Egypt, writes Origen, 
The philosophers have a sublime and secret knowledge respecting the nature of God. What did Julian imply when he spoke of the secret initiations into the sacred mysteries of the seven right God who lifted souls to salvation through his own nature? Who were these blessed, the urgists, who understood these profundities concerning what Julian dare not speak? If this inner doctrine were always concealed from the masses for whom a simpler code had been devised, is it not highly probable that the exponents of every aspect of modern civilization, philosophic, ethical, religious, and scientific, are ignorant of the true meaning of the very theories and tenets on which their beliefs are founded? Do the arts and sciences that the race has inherited from older nations conceal beneath their fair exterior a mystery so great that only the most illumined elect intelligent can grasp its import, such is undoubtedly the case. Albert Pike, who has gathered ample evidence of the excellence of the doctrines promulgated by the mysteries, supports his assertion by quoting from the writings of Clement of Alexandria, Plato, I'm not going to get this name, but Epictetus, Proclius, Aristophanes, and Cicero, all of whom unite in lauding the high ideals of these institutions from the qualified unqualified testimony of such reputable authorities no reasonable doubt can exist that the initiates of greece egypt and other ancient countries possess the correction the correct solution to those great cultural intellectual moral and social problems which is an unsolved state confront the humanity of the 12th century the reader must not interpret this state to mean that antiquity had foreseen and analyzed every complexity of this generation, but rather that the mysteries had evolved a method whereby the mind was so trained in the fundamental verities of life that it was able to cope intelligently with an emergency which might arise. Thus, the reasoning faculties were organized by a simple process of mental culture for it was asserted that where reason reigns supreme, inconsistency cannot exist. Wisdom, it was maintained, lifts man to the condition of godhood, a fact that explains an enigmatic statement that the mysteries transform roaring beasts into divinities. The preeminence of any philosophical system can be determined only by the excellence of its products. The mysteries have been demonstrated the superiority of their culture by giving to the world minds of such overwhelming greatness, souls of such beautific visions, and lives of such an outstanding impeccability that even after the lapse of ages, the teachings of these individuals constitute the present spiritual, intellectual, and ethical standards of the race. The initiates of the various mystery schools of past ages from a venerable golden chain of Superman and Superwoman connecting heaven and earth. They are the links of the Homeric golden chain with such Zeus boasted he could bind the several parts of the universe to the pinnacle of Olympias. The sons and daughters of Isis are indeed an illustrious, illustrious line, founders of science and philosophies, patrons of arts and crafts, supporting by the transparency of their divin divinely given power, the structures of world religions erected to do them homage, founders of doctrines which have molded the lives of the uncounted generations. These in initiate teachers bear witness to that spiritual culture, which has always existed and always will exist as a divine institution in the world of men. Those who represent an ideal beyond the comprehension of the masses must face the persecution of the unthinking multitude who are without the divine idealism, which inspires progress and those rational faculties, which unerring sift truth from falsehood. The lot of initiate teacher is therefore almost invariably an unhappy one. Pythagoras crucified his university burned. Hypatia, torn from her chariot and, and rendered limb from limb. 
Jacques de Molay, whose memory survives the consuming flame. Severalia burned in the square of Florence, Galileo forced to recant upon bent knee. Giordano Bruno, burned by the Inquisition. Roger Bacon, compelled to carry on his experiments in the secrecy of his cell and leave his knowledge hidden under cipher. Dante Alighieri, dying in exile from his beloved city. Francis Bacon, patent under the burden of persecution. Caglistro, the most verified man of modern times, all this illustrious line bear unending witness of man's inhumanity to man. The world has ever been prone to heap plaudits upon its fools and clumny upon its thinkers. Here and there, notable exceptions occur, as in the case of Comte de Saint Germain. I don't do the Latin thing so well. A philosopher <coughs> who survived his inquis inquisit inquisitors, I'm not getting that out, and through the sheer transcendency of his genius won a position of comparative immunity. But even the illustrious Comite, whatever, whose illumined intellect merited the homage of the world, could not escape being branded on imposter, a charlatan, and an adventurer. From this long list of immortal men and women who have represented the ancient wisdom before the world, three have been chosen as outstanding examples for more detailed consideration. The first, the eminent woman philosopher of all ages. The second, the most maligned and persecuted man since the beginning of Christian era. The third, the most brilliant and most successful modern exponent of the ancient wisdom. Hang on. Hypatia, if I'm pronouncing that right. Sitting in the chair of philosophy previously occupied by her father, Theon, the mathematician, the immortal Hypatia was for more was for many years a central figure in the Alexandria school of Neoplatonists. Platonism, famed alike for the depth of her learning and the charm of her person, beloved by the citizens of Alexandria and frequently consulted by the magistrates of that city, this noble woman stands out from the pages of history as the greatest of the pagan martyrs, a personal disciple of the magician Plutarch and versed in the profundities of the Platonic school. Hypatia eclipsed in argument and public esteem every proponent of the Christian doctrines in the northern Egypt. While her writings perish at the time of the burning of the Library of Alexandria by the Mohammedans, some hint of their nature may be gleaned from the statements of contemporary authors. Hypatia evidently wrote a commentary on the arithmetic of Deophantus, another of the astronomical canon of autonomy, and third on the conics of Apollonius of Perga. Cenius, Bishop of Ptolemus, her devoted friend, wrote to Hypatia for assistance in the construction of an astrolabe and a hydroscope. Recognizing the transparency of her intellect, the learned of many nations flocked to the academy where she lectured. A number of writers were, have credited the teachings of Hypatia with being Christian in spirit. In fact, she removed the veil of mystery in which the new cult had enshrouded itself, discoursing with such clarity upon most involved principles that many newly converted to the Christian faith deserted it to become her disciples. Hypatia not only proved conclusively the pagan origin of the Christian faith, but also exposed the purported miracles that advanced by the Christians as tokens of divine presence by demonstrating the natural laws controlling the phenomena. At the time, Cyril, later to be renowned as the founder of the doctrine of the Christian Trinity and canonized for his zeal, was Bishop of Alexandria. Seeing in Hypatia a continual menace, to the promulgation of the Christian faith, Cyril, indirectly at least, was the cause of her tragic end. Despite every later effort to exonerate him from the stigma of her murder, 
The inconvertible fact remains that he had no effort to avert the foul and brutal crime. The only shred of excuse, the only shred of excuse, which might <clears throat> be offered in his defense, is that blinded by the spell of fanaticism, Cyril considered Hypatia to be a sorceress in league with the devil. In contrast to otherwise general ex excellence of the literacy works of Charles Kingsley, may be noted his puerile delineation of the character of Hypatia and his works by the name. Without exception, the meager historical reference to the virgin philosopher attests her virtue, integrity, and absolute devotion to the principle of truth and right. While in while it is true that the best minds of Christianity in the period may readily be absolved by the charge of precipitates criminus, the impalpable hatred of Cyril unquestionably communicated itself to more fanatical members of his faith, particularly to a group of monks from the Nitrian desert, led by Peter the Reader, a savage and illiterate man, they hacked Hypatia on the open street as she was passing from the academy to her home. Dragging the defenseless woman from her chariot, they took her to the Caesarean church. Tearing away her garments, they pounded her to death with clubs, after which they scraped the flesh from her bones with oyster shells and carried the mutilated remains to a place called Sidron, where they burned them to ashes. Thus perished in A.D. 415, the greatest woman initiate of the ancient world, and with her fell, with her fell also the Neoplatonic school of Alexandria. The memory of Hypatia has probably been perpetuated in the Halagotry. <clears throat> I don't know what that is of the Roman Catholic Church in the person of Saint Catherine of Alexandria. The Comité de Cal. Lo Calistro, the, the divine Calistro, however you pronounce it, one moment the idol of Paris, the next a lonely prisoner in a dungeon of the Inquisition, passed like a meteor across the face of France. According to his memories written by him during his confinement in the Bastille, Alexandria was born in the Malta of a noble but unknown family. He was reared and educated in Arabia under the tutelage of Altotus, a man well-versed in several branches of philosophy and science, and also a master of the transcendental arts. While Calgaristro's biographers generally ridiculed this account, they utterly failed to advance in its stead any logical solution for the source of his magnificent store of arcane knowledge. Branded as an imposter and a charlatan, his miracles declared to be Leger, Legerman, and his very generosity suspected of an ulterior motive. The Commandant de Caligastro is undoubtedly the most culminated, culminated man in modern history. The mistrust writes WHK, Trollbridge, that mystery and magic always inspired, made Calgastro with his, fan his fantastic personality an easy target for calamity. After having been riddled with abuse till he was unrecognizable prejudice, the foster child of calamity proceeded to lynch him, so to speak. For over 100 years, his character has dangled on the giblet of infamy upon which the spirit, I don't know how to say that, of tradition have inscribed a curse on anyone who shall attempt to cut him down. His fate has been his fame. He remembered in history not much for anything he did as for what was done to him. According to popular belief, Calgastro's real name was Giuseppe Balsamo, and he was in a Sicilian-born Within recent years, however, doubts have arisen to as whether this belief is in accord with the facts. It may yet be proved that in part, at least the tindre tyads of abuse heaped upon the unfortunate. Camante had been directed against the wrong man. Giuseppe Balsamo was born in 1743, an honest but humble parentage. 
From boyhood, he established <clears throat> and exhibited selfish, worthless, and even criminal tendencies. And after a series of escapades disappeared, Trout Bridge presents ample proof of the Cal Calgloistro was not Giuseppe Balsamo, thus disposing the worst accusation against him. After six months' imprisonment in the Bastille, on his trial, Calgastro was exonerated from any implication of the thief of the famous Queen's necklace, and later the fact was established that he, ha he had actually warned Colonel de Rowan of the intended crime. Despite the fact, however, that he was discharged as innocent by the French trial court, a deliberate effort to vilify Calgastro was made by an artist more talented than intelligent, who painted a picture showing him holding the fatal necklace in his hands. The trial of Calgastro has been called the prologue of the French Revolution. The smoldering animosity against Marie Antoinette and Louis XVI, engendered by the trial, later bursted forth as the Holocaust of the Reign of Terror. In his brochure, Calgastro and his Egyptian right of Freemasonry, Henry R. Evans, also ably defends this much persecuted man against the infamies of so unjustly linked with his name. Sincere investigators of the facts surrounding the life and mysterious death of Calgastro are of the opinion that the story circulated against him may be traced to the machinations of the Inquisition which in this manner sought to justify his persecution. The basic charge against Caligastro was that he had attempted to find a Masonic lodge in Rome, nothing more. All other accusations are of subsequent date. For some reason undisclosed, the Pope commuted Caligastro's sentence of death to perpetual imprisonment. This act in itself showed the regard to which Caligastro was held even by his enemies. While his death is believed to have occurred several years later in an inquisitional dungeon in the castle of San Le Leo, it is highly probable that such was the case. There are rumors that he escaped, and according to one significant story, Caligastio fled to India, where his talents received the appreciation denied them in politics read in Europe. After creating the Egyptian right, Caligastio declared that since Women have been admitted into the ancient mysteries. There was no reason why they should be excluded from the modern orders. The Princess de la Lamballe graciously accepted the dignity of mistress of honor in his secret society. And on the evening of her initiation, the most important members of the French court were present. The brilliance of affair attracted the attention of the Masonic lodges in Paris. They, their representatives, in a sincere desire to understand the Masonic mysteries, chose the learned Orientalist Court de Geblin as their spokesman and invited Comte de Caligastrio to attend a conference to assist in clearing up a number of important questions concerning Masonic philosophy. The Comte accepted the invitation. On May 10, 1785, Caligastrio attended the conference called for the purpose, and his power in simplicity immediately won for him the favorable opinion of the entire gathering. It took but a little few words for the court of Ghiblian to discover that he was talking not only to a fellow scholar, but to a man infinitely his superior. Caligastro immediately presented an address which was so unexpected, so totally different from anything ever heard before, by those assembled that all were speechless with amazement. Caligastrio declared the Rose Cross to be the ancient and true symbol of the mysteries, and after a brief description of its original symbolism, branched out into a consideration of the symbolic meaning of letters, predicting to the assembly the future of France in a graphic manner that left no room for doubt that the speaker was a man of insight and supernatural power. With the curious arrangement of the letters of the alphabet, Caligastrio foretold in detail the horrors of the coming revolution and the fall of the monarchy, describing minutely the fate of the various members of the royal family. He also prophesied the advent of Napoleon and the rise of the First Empire. All this he did to demonstrate that which can be accomplished by superior knowledge. 
Later, when arrested and sent to the Bastille, Cagliostro wrote to wrote on the wall of his cell the following cryptic message, which, when interpreted, reads: "In 1789, the Bastille will, on July 14th, be pulled down by you from top to bottom." Caligastrio was the mysterious agent of the Knights Templars, the Rosicrucian initiate whose magnificent store of learning is attested by the profundity of the Egyptian rite of Freemasonry. Thus, Comte de Caligastro remains one of the strangest characters in history, believed by his friends to have lived forever and have, to ta have taken part in the marriage of Feast of Cana and accused by his enemies of being the devil incarnate. His powers of prophecy are ably described by Alexandre Dumas in The Queen's Necklace. The world he sought to serve in his own strange way received him not, but has followed with relentless persecution down through the centuries. Even the very memory of this illustrious adept, who, unable to accomplish the great labor in hand, stepped aside in favor of his more successful counterpart, compatriot, the Comte de, de Saint Germain. <coughs> Sorry about that. The Comte de Saint Germain during the early part of the 18th century when appeared in diplomatic circles of Europe. The most baffling personality of history, a man whose life was so near a synonym of mystery that the enigma of his true identity was insolvable to his contemporaries as it has been to the later investigators. The Comité de Saint-Germain was recognized as the outstanding scholar and linguist of his day. His versatile accomplishments extended from chemistry and history to poetry and music. He played several musical instruments with great skill and among his numerous compositions was a short opera. He was also an artist of rare ability and the remarkable illustrious effects which he created on canvas are believed to have been the result of his mixing powder mother of pearl with his pigments. He gained worldwide distinction from his ability to reproduce in his paintings, the original luster of the precious stones appearing upon the costumes of his subjects. His linguistic proficiency verged on the supernatural. He spoke German, English, Italian, Portuguese, Spanish, French with the P Petit Mose uh, accent, Greek, Latin, Sanskrit, Arabic, and Chinese with such fluency that in every land he visited, he was accepted as a native. He was ambidextrous to such a degree that he could write the same article with both hands simultaneously. When the two pieces of paper were afterwards placed together with the light behind them, the writing on one sheet exactly covered letters for the letter, the writing on the other. As historian, the Comte de Saint-Germain possessed uncanny knowledge of every occurrence of the preceding 2,000 years, and in his reminiscence, he described in intimate detail events of previous centuries in which he had played important roles. He assisted Mesmer in developing the theory of mesmerism, and in all probability was the actual discoverer of that science. His knowledge of chemistry was so profound that he could remove flaws from diamonds and other precious stones, a feat which he actually performed at the request of Louis XV in 1757. He was also recognized as an art critic without a peer and was often consulted regarding painting accredited to the great masters. His claim to the possession of the fable elixir of life was born witness Two, by Madame de Pompadour, who discovered she declared that he had presented a lady of the court with a certain priceless liquid, which had the effect of preserving her youthful vivacity and beauty for over 25 years beyond the normal term. The startling accuracy of his prophetic utterances gained for him no small degree of fame. To Marie Antoinette, he predicted the fall of the French monarchy, and he was also aware of the unhappy fate of the royal family years before the revolution actually took place. The crowning evidence, however, of the Comte's genius was his penetrating grasp of the political situation of Europe and the consummate skill with which he 
prepared the thrusts of his diplomatic adversaries. He was employed by a number of European governments, including the French, as a secret agent at all times, born credentials, which gave him entry to the most elusive circles. In her excellence monograph, the Comité de Saint-Germain, The Secret of the Kings, Miss Cooper Oakley lists the most important names under which this amazing person masqueraded between the year 1710 and 1822. During the time, she writes, we have M. de Saint-Germain as the Marquis de Montfriat, Commandant de Bella Mar or Maillard at Venice, Chevalier showing at Pisa, Chevalier well done at Milan and Leipzig, Comine Salt Off of Genoa and Leghorn Gaff Tizargi at Schwalbach. I don't do good with other languages, guys, so I do apologize. There's a lot. This is like a waspy. Have fun with me. And Tresdorf Prince Ragosi at Dresden and Comedy de Saint Germain at Paris, the Haug, London, and Saint Petersburg. It is evident that M. de Saint Germain adopted these various names in the interest of the political secret service work, which historians have presumed to be the major mission of his life. The Comedy de Saint Germain has been described as a medium height and well proportioned in body and of regular and pleasing features. His complexion was somewhat swarthy and his dark hair, though often shown powdered, he dressed simply, usually in black, but his clothes were well-fitting and of the best quality. He had apparently a mania for diamonds, which he wore not only in rings, but also in his watch and chain, he sn his snuff box, and upon his buckles. A jeweler once estimated the value of his shoe buckles at 200,000 francs. The commenté is generally depicted as a man in middle life, entirely devoted of wrinkles and free from any physical in infamy. He ate no meat and drank no wine, in fact, seldom dined in the presence of any second person, although he was looked upon as a charlatan and imposter by a few nobles of the French court. Louis XV severely reprimanded a courtier who made a disparaging remark concerning him. The grace and dignity that characterized his conduct together with his perfect control of every situation attested the initiate refinement and culture of one to the manner born. This remarkable person had also the surprising and impressible ability to divine, even to the most minute details, the questions of his inquisition inquisitors before they were asked by something akin to telepathy he was able to feel when his presence was needed in some distant city or state and it has even been recorded of him that he had the astonishing habit not only of appearing in his own apartment and in those of friends without resorting to conventionally of the door conventionality of the door but of also departing therefom in a similar manner M. de St. Germain's travels covered many countries during the reign of Peter III. He was in Russia and between the years 1737 and 1742 in the court of the Shah of Persia as an honored guest on the subject of his wanderings. Una Birch writes, the travels of the Comte de St. Germain covered a long part lo English Long period of years and great range of countries from Persia to France, from Calcutta to Rome, he was known and respected. Horace Walpole spoke with him in London in 1745. Clive knew him in India. And in 1756, Madame de Adhimer alleges that she met him in Paris. 1789, five years after his supposed death, while other persons pretended to have held conversations with him in the early 19th century. He was on familiar and initiate terms with the crown heads of Europe and the honored friend of many distinguished persons of all nationalities. He is even mentioned in the memoirs of letters of the day and always as a man of mystery, Frederick the Great, Voltaire, Madame de Papar, Rossinou, Chatham, and Warpole, all of those whom knew him personally, 
rivaled each other in curiosity as to his origin. During the many decades in which he was before the world, however, no one succeeded in discovering why he appeared as a Jacobit agent in London, as a conspirator in St. Petersburg, as alchemist and connoisseur of pictures in Paris, or as a Russian general at Naples. Now and again, the curtain which shrouds his actions in is drawn aside, and we are permitted to see him fiddling with the music room of Versailles, gossiping with Horace Walpole in London, sitting in Frederick's The Great's Library at Berlin, or conducting illuminous meetings in the caverns by the Rhine. The Comité, <clears throat> the Comité de Saint-Germain has been generally regarded as an important figure in every early activities of the Freemasons. Repeated efforts, however, probably with an ulterior motive, have been made to discredit his Masonic affiliations. An example of this is the account appearing in the secret tradition in Freemasonry by Arthur Edward Waite. This author, after making several rather disparaging remarks on the subject, amplifies his article by reproducing an engraving of the wrong Comité de Saint-Germain, apparently being unable to distinguish between the great Illuminus and the French general. It will yet be established beyond all doubt that the Comité de Saint-Germain was both a Mason and a Templar. In fact, the memoirs of Caligastrio contain a direct statement of his initiation into the Order of the Knights Templar at the hands of Saint Germain. Many of the illustrious personages with whom the Comte de Saint Germain associated were high masons and sufficient memorabilia had been preserved concerning the discussions which they held to prove that he was a master of Freemasonic lore. <clears throat> It is also reasonably certain that he was connected with the Rosicrucians, possibly having been the actual head of that order. The Comité de Saint-Germain was thoroughly conversant with the principles of Oriental esotericism. He practiced the Eastern system of meditation and concentration upon several occasions, having been seen seated with his feet crossed and hands folded in the posture of a Hindu Buddha. He had, a, he had a retreat in the heart of the Himalayas, to which he retired periodically from the world. One would occasion he declared that he would remain in India for 85 years and then would return to the scene of the European labors. At various times, he admitted that he was obeying the orders of a power higher and greater than himself. What did he not say was that the superior power was the mystery school which had sent him into the world to accomplish a definite mission. The Comte de Saint-Germain and Sir Francis Bacon are two greatest emissaries sent into the world by the secret brotherhood in the last thousand years. E. Francis Undy, a theosophical writer in of the belief that the Comte de Saint-Germain was not the, the son of Prince Roxy, of Transylvania, I'm totally butchering that name by the way, but because of his age could have been none other than the prince himself, who was known to be of a deep philosophic and mystic nature. The same writer believes that the convent de Saint Germain passed through the philosophic death as Frank Francis Bacon in 1626, as Francois Rakzini in 1735 and as Comte de Saint-Germain in 1784. He also feels that the Comte de Saint-Germain was the famous Comte de Gabalis and as Count Humpetch was the last Grand Master of the Knights of Malta. It is well known that many members of the European secret societies had feigned death for various purposes. Marshal Nye a member of the Society of Unknown Philosophers escaped the firing squad and under the name of Peter Stewart Nye lived and taught school for over 30 years in North Carolina. On his deathbed, P.S. Nye told Dr. Locke, the attending physician, that he was Marshal Ney of France. In concluding on an article on the identity of the inscrutable Comte de Saint-Germain, Andrew Lang writes, did St. Germain really die in the palace of Prince Charles of Hesse about 1780 through 85? Did he, or the other hand, escape from the French prison where, grossly, 
thought he saw him during the French Revolution, was he known to Lord Lytton about 1860? Is his mysterious Muscovit advisor of the Dalai Lama? Who knows? He is a will-o'-wisp of the memoir of writers of the 18th century. Interesting. Episodes, <laughs> I just tried, I just paused to clear my throat. <laughs> <clears> throat> Episodes from American history. Many times the question has been asked, was Francis Bacon's vision of the new Atlantis, a prophetic dream of the great civilization which was so soon to rise upon the soil of the new world. It cannot be doubted that the secret societies of Europe conspired to establish upon the American continent a new nation. Conceived in liberty and dedicated to the pro proposition that all men were created equal. Two incidents in the early history of the United States evidence the influence of the silent body which has so long guided the destinies of peoples and religions. By them, nations are created as vehicles for the promulgation of ideas. And while nations are true to those ideals, they survive. When they vary from them, they vanish like the Atlantis of old, which has ceased to know the gods. In his admirable little treaty, Our Flag, Robert Allen Campbell revives the details of an obscure but most important episode of American history, the designing of the colonial flag of 1775. The account involves a mysterious man concerning whom no information is available other than that he was familiar terms with both General George Washington and Dr. Benjamin Franklin. The following description of him is taken from Campbell's treaty. As the page is stuck. Little seems to have been known concerning the old gentleman and in the materials from which this account is compiled, his name is not even once mentioned for he is uniformly spoken of or referred to as the professor. He was evidently far beyond his three score and 10 years. And he often referred to historical events of more than a century previous, just as if he had been a living witness of their occurrence. Still, he was erect, vigorous, and active, hale, hearty, and clear-minded as a strong, energetic, very in every way, as in the prime of his life. He was tall, a fine figure, perfectly easy, and very dignified in his manners, being at once courteous, gracious, and commanding. He was, for those times, and considering the customs of the colonists, very peculiar in his method of living, for he ate no flesh, fowl, or fish. He never used for food any green things, any roots, or anything unripe. He drank no liquor, wine, or ale, but confined his diet to cereals and their products, fruits that were ripened on the stem in the sun, nuts, mild tea, and sweets of honey, sugar, or molasses. He was very well educated, highly cultivated of extensive, as well as varied information, and very studious. He spent considerable of his time in the pa patient and persistent cunning of a number of very odd, old, rare books and ancient manuscri manuscripts which he seemed to be deciphering, translating, or rewriting. These books and manuscripts, together with his own writings, he never showed to anyone. And he did not even mention them in his conversations with the family, except in the most casual way, and he always locked them up carefully in a large, old-fashioned, cubically-shaped, iron-bound, heavy oaken chest. Whenever he left his room, even for his meals, he took long and frequent walks alone, sat on the brows of the neighboring hills, or mused in the mists of the green and flower-gemmed meadows. He was fairly liberal, but in no way lavish, in spending his money, with which he was well supplied. He was a quiet, though a very genial and very interesting member of the family, and he was seemingly at home upon any and every topic coming up in conversation. He was, in short, one whom everyone would notice and respect, whom few would feel well acquainted with, 
in whom no one would presume to question concerning himself as to whence he came, why he tarried, or whither he journeyed. By something more than a mere coincidence, the committee appointed by the Colonial Congress to design a flag accepted an invitation to be guests. While in Cambridge of the same family with which the professor was staying, it was here that General Washington joined them for the purpose of deciding upon a fitting emblem. By the signs which passed between them, it was evident that both General Washington and Dr. Franklin recognized the professor, and by unanimous approval, he was invited to become an active member of the committee. During the proceedings which followed, the professor was treated with the most profound respect, and all of his suggestions immediately acted upon. He submitted a pattern which considered symbolically appropriate for the new flag, and this was unhesitatingly accepted by other six members of the committee, who voted that the arrangement suggested by the professor be forthwith adopted. After the episode of the flag, the professor quietly vanished and nothing further is known concerning him. Did General Washington and Dr. Franklin recognize the professor as an emissary of the mystery school, which has so long controlled the political destinies of this planet? Benjamin Franklin was a philosopher, a Freemason, possibly a Russia-Crucian initiate. He and the Marquis de Lafayette, also a son of mystery, constituted two of the most important links in the chain of circumstance that culminated in the establishment of the original 13 American colonies as a free and independent nation. Dr. Franklin's philosophic attainments are well attested in Poor Richard's Almanac, published by him for many years under the name of Richard Saunders. His interest in the cause of Freemasons, <clears throat> Freemasonry is also shown by his Republican, sorry, Republication, of Anderson's Constitutions of Freemasonry, a rare and much disputed work on the subject. It was during the evening of July 4, 1776, that the second phase of these mysterious episodes occurred. In the old state house in Philadelphia, a group of men were gathered for the monumentous task of severing the last tie between the old country and the new. It was a grave moment and a few, uh, not a few of those present feared that their lives would be the forfeit for their audacity. In the midst of the debate, a fierce voice rang out. The debater stopped and turned to look upon the stranger who was this man and who had suddenly appeared in their midst and transfixed them in his oratory. They had never seen him before. Knew no, none knew when he had entered, but his tall form and pale face filled with them awe, his voice ringing with holy zeal. The stranger stirred them to their very souls. His closing words rang through the building. God has given America to be free. As the stranger sank into the chair exhausted, a wild enthusiasm burst forth. Name after name was placed upon the parchment. The Declaration of Independence was signed. But there was the man who had precipitated the accomplishment of this immortal task. <clears throat> who had lifted for a moment the veil from the eyes of the assemblage and revealed to them a part at least of the great purpose for which the new nation was conceived. He had disappeared, nor was he ever seen again or his identity established. This episode parallels others of a similar kind recorded by ancient historians attended upon the founding of every new nation. Are there... Are they coincidences or do they demonstrate that the divine wisdom of the ancient mystery still is present in the world, serving mankind as it did of old? And that is going to literally end that section. And next time I will read the conclusion to this book and give some thoughts on it. So guys, Sending each and every one of you love, light, compassion, grace, shielding and protective energy. Please go within and go into your heart space. Be the shoulders for others to lean on. Be the lighthouse for others to find. See your truths and know that you are worthy. You are loved. You are worth it. And I hope all of you have a blessed day. Thank you for sharing, liking, and subscribing to my channel and just overall support. And I'll see you guys on the next one. Bye for now.